Let's talk about used appliances and the possibility of getting scammed by purchasing a set online, whether it's Facebook, Craigslist, OfferUp, or if you're watching way into the future, some other platform where you can purchase used items. Now, buying used appliances is actually a really great thing. And the sad part is you can get scammed from people selling appliances. Just a few days ago, I saw someone local in another city that was recounting the story that they had purchased a washer dryer set off of someone. They got lied to by the person about being able to get a replacement and now they're out a washer dryer set. And I've had a few people ask for this style video. We've ran through tens of thousands of stoves, fridges, washers and dryers and learned a few things about how to look for possible failures, even if we can't plug the machines in. I just got a load of untested appliances and I wanna go through each of these different appliances with you to see what we can find out without plugging them in and a few things you can do when you plug them in. So let's go through all these different machines today and figure out what to look for to avoid a scam. I wanna show you how to check these out to make sure there aren't any major problems whether or not you can get, have electricity to them. And again, I'll go throughout this video a lot and tell you that plugging them in and running them is the, definitely the best thing to do, but there are some warning signs you can look for and avoid when not having electricity to them. If you go buy a used appliance, that take a screwdriver along if you're not buying it from a reputable store like what I have. So let's look at this thing. Again, none of these are tested. I'm kind of ad-libbing everything, but I wanna show you how to check these things out. First thing we're gonna do is open the lid up. What you typically wanna do on anything modern is do two things once you've opened the lid up. First thing we're gonna do is push the tub down and see what happens when we push the entire tub down. We wanna push it down and release it. Push the tub all the way down and release it. See what happens when you do this on a washing machine and see how fast it snaps back up. Any top load washing machine that's new has four suspension rods in the side and it doesn't flop around like LeBron James. Well, you've got something that should be good on the suspension, but if it does bounce up like a basketball or flop like LeBron James, you're going to have an issue with the suspension rods and it will not spin up to speed. Next and probably even more important is to take the side of the tub and spin it as hard as you can and see if you hear anything. We don't hear anything, but there is an issue. Not only do you need to listen for issues like grinding, clicking, like bearings rubbing against each other. If you hear any of those things, there could be a major problem. You also want to look at the tub because on this unit, I've already spotted something that is a major issue with this. You don't hear it, but let's go closer and I'll show you. Hopefully you can see it is that the inner tub, the plat, the metal inner tub is running independently of the outer tub. It is not exactly circular and it's not running perfect. As I was running it and talking, you can tell that there is some play on the inner and outer basket of this tub. This is a major issue. When we test this out later, you're gonna find that this machine is going to shake itself apart. This is a newer Whirlpool washing machine and I think the reason that someone got rid of it is entirely because of this. If you're buying this and it was used, uh, you just wouldn't want to do it. You would lose your money. But let's do look at a few other things with this kind of uh, washing machine that could be potential issues that you want to look for. And we'll go through a few more units too. Next, try to spin the wash plate or agitator and pay attention to how it runs. Does it flop around a little too easily or is there some reasonable resistance? Honestly, this one feels a little bit suspect and I do expect further issues from this unit. Next, let's go to the rear of the washing machine and look at the valves for any sort of clues. Are they clean? <laughs> These are absolutely horrific. The person who had this washer had well water, which can easily cause issues with the washing machine. The filters are totally clogged. When I take them out, you can see that they're really in bad shape and hot water probably wouldn't even run through this machine if we tried to run it. Now let's go and tilt the unit rearward and look underneath for any clues on damage. Overall, this unit actually seems in good shape underneath, but there is a cover that I'm going to go ahead and remove with my 11-in-1 screwdriver to reveal the pulley system. And these 11-in-1 screwdrivers are really useful, and I will have a link and product tag in the description for this. Again, it looks like everything underneath the cover is in good shape. I would be looking for problems like gear case oil, rust, dirt, a missing belt, or anything that would be other damage that I could note if I was looking at buying a unit. Let's go ahead and do some tests that may be a little bit exclusive to the front loaders. Generally, front loaders are gonna be the same between the different makes and models. 
So the big thing I always look for is open the door and give it a spin much like a top loader. We have the door open and we just want to spin the tub and see what we hear. Oh, that does not sound good at all. It sounds like someone may have tried to wash concrete in it or something and damaged something on the inside of the washing machine. So if you ever hear anything on the inside of the tub, if you're buying it used, it's definitely something that you want to go ahead and fail the washing machine already. Another thing you want to look out for is when you spin it, try to look and see if the inner tub and the outer tub is warped. It's very similar to the top load we just saw where the inner and outer tubs were displaced against each other, but it's way more common on front load washing machines. If the inner and outer tub have play, it means that the unit has a bad or damaged spider bracket, which is a very expensive thing to fix. So again, if you hear anything, just don't buy the unit at all. Other things to look for easily on a front load washing machine like this usually involve taking the top of the washing machine off. Usually on almost all models, there's two or three screws on the back of the unit that can be taken off. Then the back panel can be slid off to reveal what is behind the top. The things you want to look for underneath the top would be hose damage, concrete blocks damaged, or missing from the front, or anything just generally misplaced or out of order. You can't always see a lot revealed from the top, but it's easy to look at to get an idea of the overall cleanliness and appearance of a washing machine. The dispenser here can come out and we can peer inside to see if there's anything, if there's any sort of caked on detergent, if it's clean or not. Usually there's a small lever in the back left or right corner to pull this out. Behind most front load washing machines, the rear plate can be removed to reveal the motor and other pieces. This will give you a clear vantage point to see if anything is damaged or misplaced. Now, not every washing machine can be spun by hand. Older units have a clutch and brake system in them and that will prevent them from being spun but always check behind and underneath the units anytime possible. The valves on this look good, but they have Teflon tape for some reason. And underneath the washing machine, it's clean, but there is some rust on this old transmission. This Kenmore washer was made in 1998, so I expect a little bit of wear and tear on it, but overall it looks in good shape, really. I have another top load Whirlpool washing machine, and the tub when pressed is a little bit bouncy, but that horrible wobble we saw in the first washer is even worse on this unit. And if I was considering buying this unit not to make a video but make profit with, I would be very concerned. Underneath there's no plastic cover. Someone's definitely been noodling in this washing machine, which tells me either a tech tried to fix it and either gave up on it or gave them a price that was way too high to fix it. Always avoid units that look like they were attempted to be fixed and given up on. You'd see that with missing parts, covers, or caps, and nothing was put back properly. Finally, we have the last washing machine that I got for this video. It is a Kenmore HE2. It's quite old. Some of these units have kick plates underneath and it will let me look inside. Visually, there's a little bit of rust, but nothing that looks very problematic. If you see major rust spots, it would signal that there is a leak in the valves or a hose somewhere. And that would be absolutely horrible if you tried to buy a unit only to put it on hardwood floors and to end up damaging them. Now, of course, the best way to test the washer is actually just run the darn thing, but that can take a long period of time. And the smartest thing to do, if you can, is just run it in diagnostics and see if it spins. 90% of the time, if it can't spin, well, obviously it's bad, but spin tends to be the most difficult thing for the unit to perform. And if it can manage to do that, everything else tends to be okay. It's always something that we do because it's so quick to do. Now, let's see how fast I can do this, if I know what I'm doing. Spin. Let's see what happens. This one has the bad tub in it, so let's see how bad it gets. Oh, that's bad. <laughs> that does not sound very encouraging on a unit that's only three years old. And within two minutes, I've basically diagnosed this. I could have avoided everything. 
just by throwing this one into diagnostics. What's going on is way worse than just the hub going bad. It refused to even go into the spin mode. We heard all that noise and then it didn't actually go into the high RPM spin, which tells me that this unit's, um, it's gone. It's scrap. It's absolutely scrap. On dryers, the ultimate question is whether or not they heat. You have to have them plugged in, otherwise you have to tear, use a multimeter and basically tear them apart. But the one thing you can look for when looking at a used set is whether or not the drum and the bearings are okay. So we want to go to the front of the unit and open the door and do some tests. Spin the drum and listen for anything. Some dryers go clockwise and others go counterclockwise, so listen both ways but be very gentle. There's some noise in this middle one when we spin it clockwise. I tested the other two dryers as well, and there was much less noise on them in a side-by-side -side comparison, suggesting there could be something a little bit wrong with this Maytag Bravos. Another thing I like to look for when spinning the dryers by hand is making sure that they go a little bit further than when I release them. If they immediately stop running, there could be an issue with a roller. A dryer should be able to spin freely without any noise, or major obstructions, but not too freely to indicate that there may not even be a belt on the unit. Next, check the lint filters. Are they cleaned and maintained or are they rusty and dirty? This is usually a big giveaway on there being potential issues. The Amana dryer is absolutely clean, the middle Bravos dryer has some lint on it, and the Maytag on the left side seem okay. All these filters are similar. Many units have the filter in the bottom of the door when you open it up. Another thing that can be checked on dryers visually is that the rear of the dryer, there is a terminal block where the power cord connects to the dryer. Check for discoloration on the screws and as well, check for damage on the plugs or terminal blocks, anything connected to that terminal area. Sometimes these can be burnt, damaged, melted, and it will cause the machine either not to heat or not even run. And this is a common point of failure that people could hide when selling a dryer. Next, let's look at the vent pipes, which are usually at the bottom of the dryers. The left and right ones from the rear are, are amazingly clean, but the middle one absolutely does not. You can see remnants of wet lint at the bottom of the pipe along with some rust. Visually, we've had multiple red flags on this dryer, so let's go ahead and try it out. I suspect this one's either going to not heat or it's not going to start. Make sure that any dryer you turn, if it's an old style mechanical like this, you always go clockwise. They do, the gearing does not like you going counterclockwise. I've actually had customers break a few of these before by turning them the wrong way. Yep, yeah. something's wrong with it. 95% chance it's gonna be vent restriction that causes this to die. The white thermal fuse is bad. Great, great flip, but bad for a consumer. Now, after failing the Maytag Bravos dryer, one of my techs actually worked on it off screen and found this. The blower was totally melted and was caked with lint that we removed. According to him, there was so much lint in the unit, it melted the fan as well as destroying the sensors, preventing it from running. The other two units that passed the visual inspection actually ran fine without any issues and they heated, by the way. Let's talk about how to prevent yourself from getting scammed on refrigerators if you're buying one used. The reality is the only way to get a used refrigerator that you know is good and working is to actually make sure it's plugged in, running, and is looking to go cold. How you want to make sure that it's cold, there are two easy ways to do this to verify that it works. Either one, you can use the redneck trick, which is to use either a bottle of water or ice cubes, but the ultimate test is to use a infrared thermal gun. If you don't have one of these, and you're gonna look at used fridges, I highly suggest buying one, and I will have a link for it in the description. But otherwise, you could just use a set of ice trays, like in this one, we have a set of LG Craft Ice Maker ice cubes in here that run about $10. So let's start looking at these refrigerators and some things that you can look at and do to try to avoid getting screwed on a refrigerator. Inspecting temperature using, say, your hand can be deceptive, that's why a thermal gun or ice tray works the best. A good freezer typically needs to be between 0 and 10 degrees Fahrenheit and around 40 degrees in the refrigerator. A thermal gun makes this easy to verify, and ice balls like these take hours to freeze properly, making them also an amazing way to verify temperatures, and you could use a water bottle or other sort of ice trays as well. Next, inspect the rubber gaskets on the doors. Is there any damage on them? If there are any tears, cold air will leak out and moisture could creep in the refrigerator, 
costing you extra money and difficulties, and the gaskets can be potentially expensive to repair. Another thing to consider when buying a used appliance is the shelves and door bins. Are they all installed or does the refrigerator lack any that you can tell? You'd be really surprised to know that most door bins even used are $20 to $30 each, crisper drawers are $50 to $80, and the large chef pantry drawers are upwards of $100 if they are missing from whatever you're purchasing. And if you have multiple items missing, it could cost more than the refrigerator's worth. If the unit has mechanical controls, inspect the temperature settings. This is how we found the refrigerator here in this video. If the unit was turned down in any particular cabinet, it suggests to me that the unit is not cooling properly and may work but may not work at the right temperatures or be indicative of an impending failure like a defrost issue. Here's a second refrigerator that we got in the batch and what it looks like with the door bins and everything. It turns on and the shelves are all intact but the temperatures are not good. One catch here though is if the unit had recently defrosted, these could be kind of false figures and be higher than normal, it could have recently warmed up which is why the ice tray test can be valuable in tandem. Used refrigerators are the trickiest appliance of them all. If the defroster is bad in a refrigerator, three weeks after you buy it and take it home, thinking it's a good working unit, the refrigerator could end up and stop cooling properly in one cabinet, usually the refrigerator cabinet due to a defroster going bad. It's one reason why you may want to ensure there's a 30 day warranty, or at least know that the unit's been plugged in for a few weeks to make sure it's been running for a long time before it's used, just in case. Now, if you know how to force the unit into defrost using diagnostics, that would be a perfect thing to do at this juncture if you had the right refrigerator. Another thing that you can look at when you're inspecting a refrigerator if it's not even plugged in is the panel behind the unit at the bottom. This usually contains the condenser coils and compressors. Are the coils dirty or damaged? Often, dirty coils can cause a unit not to properly, but I have found in my experience that the inverse can be true. If I see a good, newer refrigerator with immaculate coils, I do actually get worried because often it means that someone has cleaned them out because they are trying to get the refrigerator to work. And if the refrigerator doesn't work, you end up with clean coils and a non-working compressor. This seems to be super common with LG refrigerators, which fail often in the rear cabinet with the compressor or a sealed system, so be a little bit cautious if you're buying it without it being turned on running. Finally, refrigerator ice makers, everyone wants them, but there's almost no easy way to test for them other than seeing if the unit has a bucket of ice stored in the cabinet when you're inspecting it. If there's no ice in it, you can test the motors in the auger system through the paddles to see if it responds. Also again, like washing machines, most refrigerators have diagnostics on the refrigerators to test ice and water, even if they're not hooked up to see if they're in operation, but that type of test is going to vary from unit to unit. For stoves, for some reason, I do not have any used stoves that we can go over right now. All I have seemingly are brand new ones. But there are a few certain things on stoves to look for and be considerate of. But the ultimate test for stoves is to just run them because the only thing that really matters is the heat and the heat well. But a few things that you want to look for on stoves would be the door glass itself, if there's any major gashes or cuts on it. Door glass tends to be very model specific and it's very hard to get new replacement glass if it is needed, both on the top and the front. It can be extremely expensive and if we see any sort of damage, we always reject it. Handles for stoves also can be very surprisingly expensive. Now they're not as expensive as door glass or as exclusive, but expect to pay anywhere from $50 to $100 for a broken handle if someone is trying to give you a quote unquote deal. Now, on any gas or electric stove, you'd have to plug it in and make sure that the element or the bake igniter works and glows properly. And the best thing to do would be to plug it in and test it. If you can't do those things and you're having to be like Bon Jovi and just live on a prayer, well, the one thing you can look at on the rear side of the stove, for specifically on an electric stove, is the terminal block exactly like we did with the dryers. Does the terminal block and the wires surrounding it look damaged, burnt, singed, or charred? If there's any such issues, then chances are, well, that's what's wrong with it, but it's also something that's broke that you will need to replace before you'd actually get a good working stove. Another thing you can do is to take a screwdriver and open up the back plate that houses the control board and do a visual inspection of the control board. Do you see any damage, pests, 
rodents or anything that could possibly be bad on the control board. Generally on most electric stoves, you could potentially see burn marks that would automatically mean that that unit will not work. It's not a perfect test, but if you don't have power to it, it's at least worth looking at. Now, let's say you can plug the stove in. What should you look for? Well, you should turn the bake on, primarily the bake, because usually the broil is okay, but the bake should be able to go up to 350 degrees, and you should be able to verify that with a temperature gun. If it can't get up to 350 and it hovers around 200 to 250 degrees, chances are the control board is damaged and it's not providing the right power to the element, which can be an expensive fix. Same thing with the stovetop elements. You wanna make sure that they turn on, they can get hot, but they also can cycle off. If a element is damaged, sometimes it can turn on, but it will run at max temperature and it will not cycle off. That can be a potentially expensive failure as well if you're trying not to get scammed. Those are the only ideas I have for stoves generally. Usually we plug them in and test them for about 15 minutes and we know one way or the other if they work or not. Now let's talk about some other tips that go for every single type of unit. First off, look for pests. If you're inspecting any appliance, stove, fridge, washer, or dryer, one of the scariest things that we come in contact with are bugs, namely roaches. If you see the presence of roach poop, run away immediately. If we find a unit in any of the appliances we try to purchase that has roaches, no matter how nice the appliance is, we immediately quarantine it outside and essentially throw it away because you run the risk of infestation. And not only are you going to probably be out the appliance because the roaches have damaged the electronics, you're going to be out a exterminator call, which makes a problem of just a bad fridge turn into something way, way worse. Another pest to look out for are mice. This tends to be a more of a stove thing, but they can permeate through other appliances. But mice tend to enjoy getting into the padding or insulation of a stove and making a little nest. When mice get in your appliance, they can compromise, for example, on a stove, the insulation, leading to various hot spots in it that will cause a lot of damage. They can bite through and eat through the various wires, causing the entire appliance to fail. And if they do that, it tends to be very hard to trace down where maybe they've damaged something. So if you see any evidence of mice, again, you don't want to deal with it and just move on to the next thing. Finally, one consideration to make on whatever you choose, understand that accidents do happen. Even running a used appliance store for about seven years now, every so often we do run into circumstances where we have sold a good working appliance that somehow turns bad for the customer. But when you go to a used appliance store, you are getting a warranty. And that warranty is just as much for you as it is for us because we want to make sure that you get a good working appliance and it does cost us money to have that warranty. But do understand that you can have problems that are not caused by a scammer or a used appliance store. It can actually be something on your end, sometimes by accident, sometimes by ignorance. With dryers, oftentimes we find that vents are not properly cleaned by the customer before we try to install the dryer and oftentimes you could install a dryer and it will heat, but it will not dry your clothes, meaning there's a restriction somewhere in the vents. And if that happens, it's not on us, it's you. Another situation that we run into are outlets that do not work in the house. Just last Friday, we sold a Samsung washing machine to someone that purchased it, ran it for a day, and then messaged me when I was on my child's field trip saying he was going to ruin my life if we didn't come get the bleeping front load washer from him. And we knew that we had sold a good working front load washer to this gentleman. So I did the right thing. We fixed the trade-in washer that he gave us for $35, tested it at our shop, made sure it worked, sent it back to him only to find out that when he installed his old now working washing machine, that it won't work on the outlet, nor would a lamp or anything else. His electrical outlet had been tripped off somehow and blamed our washing machine rather than his electricity. It ended up costing me a lot of money, which was very unfortunate. But do understand that those kinds of situations can happen. So make sure you do your due diligence between your vents and your electrical outlets, and also how you transport an appliance from wherever you purchase it to your home. Sometimes a bump in the road can cause a suspension rod to come unhinged, 
causing some problems. These things do happen from time to time and always be cautious of these. But I hope that all these different things to look for on your stoves, fridges, washers, and dryers makes a lot of sense. I didn't talk about microwaves and dishwashers. Microwaves, you have to plug them in. Let them run with even a bottle of water to make sure it gets warm. You wanna make sure that the plate turns and it heats up, otherwise you're gonna have a major problem. With dishwashers, you gotta run a cycle through them and make sure that the filter is clean. That tends to be a common problem on those units, but unfortunately there's not a lot of things you can eyeball other than filter on the dishwasher. But that's what I have for you today. I hope that this video helped you out. Time to get back to work on fixing more appliances and see how these units that we looked at end up turning out. Have a great day.